Our text this morning is Luke 20, 27 through 40. As Ben said, um, DJ and I were kind of the original part of the church. It was a little over nine years ago this past fall that Ben called me and asked if he'd be interested in planting a church, to which I said firmly, no. Uh, he called and asked again. I said, no. DJ and I said, no, over and over and over again. Uh, and then, by the grace of God, things began to open up in the ARP denomination. A number of phone calls were made. Some of them were answered. But finally, the Lord got through to, to our, our provisional uh, presbytery that helped us get things going. And so that's been a little over nine years. And so it's pretty amazing to see what God has done uh, because in the beginning, I mean, as many of you know, it literally was a handful of us in a bucket of fried chicken meeting on Sunday nights, praying for God to bring people to our, our group. So, so thankful you're here. And let's get to our text. So Luke 20, 27 through 40. This is the word of the Lord. There came to him some Sadducees, those who denied that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies... Having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as wife. And Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore, because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dare to ask him any question. Let's pray. Father, again, this is your text. We are your people. Take the truth of this text. Press it into our hearts. Help us to clearly see our Savior in it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Every single day, human beings live and operate based on false assumptions. Here are some famous ones I found online. Charles Duell was the commissioner at the U.S. Patents Office. In 1899, gave his opinion that everything that can be invented has been invented already. H.G. Wells, the eminent British author, said in 1902, I refuse to see any sort of submarine doing anything except suffocating its crew and floundering at sea. General Douglas Haig, the commander of the British Army in World War I, said in 1914 of the machine gun, make no mistake, this weapon will change absolutely nothing. Irving Fisher was professor of economics at Yale University. In 1929, he pronounced, stocks have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. Dr. Albert Einstein said in 1932, there is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. Admiral William Lehigh told President Truman in 1945, the atomic bomb will not go off, and I speak as an expert in explosives. Uh, Don Rowe, one of my favorites, was the director of DECA Records who turned down the Beatles. He said to their promoter, Brian Epstein, we don't like your boy's sound, and besides, groups of guitarists are on the way out. Maybe my very favorite. Bill Gates stated in 1981, $640,000 is enough for anybody. Those are some pretty famous historical blunders. Uh, statements that were made completely based on false assumptions. And we kind of snicker at that, but the truth is that every single day, ordinary human beings live their lives based on false assumptions. They, in fact, actually stake their lives, the, everything about them, based on false assumptions. And that's what we see in our text today. So this morning, I want to talk about two things. First, those false assumptions. And second, our future glory. Well, let's talk about those false assumptions. Now, I've not been here, but I know that Ben's been preaching through Luke. 
So the past few Sundays, you guys have seen Jesus in the temple dealing with religious people, right? The money changers, the leaders themselves, and then a group of spies sent by the religious leaders. Today, Jesus engages the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the priestly aristocracy. That's what commentators call them. They were part of the ruling elite. And they, in fact, uh, their priests had the majority stake of power in the Sanhedrin, which was basically the, the Supreme Court. They were powerful, well-educated, wealthy, and very religious. But their religion differed greatly from that of the Pharisees. And we see the greatest difference in verse 1 of the text. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in it. Now, the Sadducees read the Pentateuch, just like the Pharisees, to be sure. But for the Sadducees, it was just a basic guide for life, because to them, there was no life after death. That's a big assumption. And it's that assumption that led them to Jesus. According to verses 28 through 33, they asked Jesus what we read to be a pretty convoluted question. The question was based on the Leverite law in Deuteronomy 25, which says that if two brothers live together and one of them dies without a son, that the living brother is to marry his dead brother's wife and provide a son in order to continue the line. That's the setup. And here's what the Sadducees say in verses 29 through 32. Look down with me. They say this. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her. And likewise, all seven left no children. Afterward, the woman also died. So that's the setup. And then here's the question in verse 33. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will this woman be? Now, this is an absurd question. And that's the point. The Sadducees are not interested at all in theology. They're interested in what Ben said earlier in tripping up Jesus. They're basically mocking the resurrection. So here they are, part of the priestly religious class, attacking the Messiah for preaching and teaching about the afterlife. So they have, in fact, staked their entire lives on a major false assumption that leads to several other big ones. The major one I've already said is that there is no afterlife. But if you don't believe in the afterlife, it means that you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And if you don't believe in the resurrection of the dead, by fact, you don't believe in any sort of reward or punishment for how we live our lives on this side of eternity. That is a religion without any teeth without any substance whatsoever, which is probably why the Sadducees live their lives to make a lot of money, to be wealthy, and to be famous, because they had no reason else to live. To them, all that mattered was the here and now. As the great philosopher Dave Matthew sings, Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, because we're tripping billies, or pushing daisies. That was the motto of the Sadducees. And if you think about it, of all the false assumptions to base your life on, this one seems to me to be the craziest. Philosophers for centuries have claimed that every single human being that is alive has to deal with a fundamental set of questions, no matter what they say they believe religiously. And those questions are always haunting us. Here are the questions. How did we get here? Is there right or wrong? Is there meaning in life? Uh, what, are, what are human beings? And most importantly, what happens when we die? You see, at least the Sadducees are being honest about where they're coming from. Now, I don't watch much late-night television, uh, but I have recently taken notice of Stephen Colbert, who I actually stood next to in the Publix over here when I lived here, crazily enough. Uh, again, I don't watch a lot of late-night television, but Stephen Colbert recently has had an interesting way of bringing up ultimate questions to all of his guests in the form of what he calls the Colbert Questionnaire. Has anybody seen this out there? So he brings his guests in and he asks them all the same questions. Here are a few of the questions. The first question is, what is the best sandwich? What is the scariest animal? Have you ever asked someone for their autograph? What's your favorite action movie? They're all kind of like that. They're lighthearted. The, the, the guests love it. The audience loves it. 
But then he gets to the middle of the questionnaire and he asks this question. What do you think happens when we die? I've watched this, I've watched him interview a number of guests, and every single one of them is caught off guard when he asks that question. Here are a few of their responses. Seth Rogen said, oh man, I don't know. Tom Hanks said, I think we race automobiles. We put on crash helmets and beat A.J. Foyt. Meryl Streep said, I think we see everyone we loved and get to influence all the lives we left behind. George Clooney said, I don't know. Maybe there's something. I hope there's a bar out there we all hang out at. Bradley Cooper said, oh man, you tell me, I have no idea. John Stewart classically said, very little. And then John Krasinski said, I, I think there's something out there waiting for us. To me, it's interesting that some of the most well-respected and loved and adored people in our culture don't really have a solid answer for one of life's most important questions. So they, like many other people, are living their lives and staking their lives based on an assumption. And for them, the assumption, just like the Sadducees, is that the afterlife is either unknowable or it simply doesn't matter. But of course, for Christ, it does. Our second point this morning is future glory. And here, in this idea of future glory, we get to Jesus' response in verses 34 through 38. And if you look down, you'll notice we learn several important truths about several important things. First, there is an afterlife. There is a life after death. Jesus makes this clear in his response when he talks about two different groups of people, the sons of this age and the sons of the resurrection. He's saying that life does not end when we take our final breath. It, in fact, begins when we depart from this world. Our lives here are just a drop in the bucket compared to the sea of eternity that we'll either spend in God's pleasure or in God's wrath. And the proof of that is the fact that Jesus says that those that are resurrected, quote, cannot die anymore. That blows your mind a little bit if you think about it. That we live our lives now, whether or not you believe in Jesus or not, based on the fact that everyone's going to die one day. Everyone agrees, no matter what religion, that we're all going to die, that life is short. So death kind of bookends our life. Death, in fact, frames our life and gives us some semblance of meaning. But here's the thing. It won't, that, it won't be that way in the afterlife. It won't be that way in heaven. When we get to heaven and commune with Christ, we're not going to be thinking about how much time we have left or about the next step because we have entered in the last step. We're with Christ. Death won't frame life in hell either. And this is the scarier point. On earth, if you have an awful day, you can wake up the next day for a brand new start. But Christ is saying there's no waking up from eternity apart from him. There's no waking up from hell. There's no way to, there's nothing to look forward to. There's no second chances. There are no way out. It is a permanent destination. Second, Jesus points out the resurrection. Jesus makes the reality of the resurrection of the dead crystal clear in this passage. He says that only those who are worthy will attain the resurrection from the dead in verse 35. And then in verse 36, he calls those that die that are united to him, sons of the resurrection. But the kicker is in verse 37. Look at verse 37. Because in verse 37, he proves that the dead are raised by quoting in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 3, when Moses stood in front of the burning bush and was called by God. How did God identify himself to Moses in Exodus 3? If you remember, he said this, I am the God of Jacob and the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac. Now you say, what's, what's unique about that? Here's my question. Were Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob alive at that point? No. But God spoke in present tense. God did not say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Jesus is using the Old Testament, actually the Pentateuch, to prove the resurrection. 
And why is that significant? Because the Pentateuch was the Sadducees' Bible. And they swore up and down that the Old Testament, specifically the Pentateuch, had nothing to say about the resurrection. Jesus says it does. Third, our, our present life. Jesus says that what we do in our present life shapes our eternity. Look at verse 35. Jesus says that some people will be considered, quote, worthy. That's his word. Worthy to attain a future age in the resurrection from the dead. Jesus is making it very clear that only a select group of people will be in heaven with him. And it's only those who are worthy. Here's my question for you. Is Jesus here preaching good works? Is that what he's saying? That in order to go to heaven, you have to be worthy because you are a good person. You guys know the answer is obviously no. It's wrong. Jesus has spent much, much of his time preaching against that very idea. If you think back just a few chapters, Jesus told that story about two men who went to pray. Remember that story? A Pharisee and a tax collector. How did the Pharisee pray? He thanked God for his good works. I'm a great man. I love my family. I, I give my money to the temple. And I'm not like this dirty, disgusting tax collector. He prayed a prayer of self-righteousness. Yet the tax collector simply said what? God be merciful to me a what? A sinner. God be merciful to me a sinner. And Jesus said that it was not the Pharisee, not the good works guy, but the tax collector who admitted his sin to God that was counted justified before God, that was counted worthy before God. It is only those that trust in the righteousness of Christ and come to Jesus saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner, that will be counted worthy. What Jesus is saying is that it is not our worth that makes the difference. It's his. It's Jesus' worth imputed to sinners who admit that I'm a broken human being, that I am debted my sins, that I can't do anything right in life. I struggle. Those are the ones that are counted worthy. If we would just place our trust in Christ. Fourth, the fourth thing Jesus points out is our future life. In this passage, Jesus teaches us that those that are worthy to receive, uh, receive far more than heaven. Heaven's going to be awesome. Uh, but they, in fact, will receive more than heaven. They will receive himself. Because Jesus is what gives heaven meaning. In fact, Jesus is kind of stating matter-of-factly that those that believe in Christ are betrothed to him. In other words, those that have faith in Christ are betrothed in marriage to the greatest groom imaginable. And they are looking forward to the greatest wedding ceremony of all time. And that's what Jesus is digging at in verses 34 through 35 when he talks about marriage. He says that while the sons of this age might marry each other, the sons of the resurrection are not going to marry each other or be given in marriage. What's he saying? That our marriages here on earth are temporary. That's why our vows say, till death do us what? Part. Or as long as we both shall live. Our marriages are temporary. And as I say that, I know that that makes probably a lot of us sad to think about because we love our spouses. But Jesus is not trying to throw mud on you. He's trying to tee up the ultimate truth that trumps our earthly marriages. And that is that we will not be married to each other because we will be married to him. And this is made clear across the whole scripture. All the Bible says about marriage points back to God himself. Paul in Ephesians says that our marriages mirror what? Christ and the church. John in Revelation calls the church the bride. He says this in, in Revelation 19, 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride, or the church, has made herself ready. Revelation 21, 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, 
made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And Jesus, back in Luke 5, referred to himself as the bridegroom. One day, if your faith is in Christ, you'll be married to him. As an aside note, by the way, isn't it amazing how much truth Christ distills into one little paragraph? He's saying all these things. Now let's apply all this before we close this morning. First, if you are married, steward your marriage. Steward your marriage. By that, I mean that beyond the romance we ought to experience as married couples, we have to understand that marriage is not about us. Marriage, biblically, is about preparing us for our next marriage. This is kind of an intro marriage for our future marriage. About preparing us for the future bridegroom. Marriage is not about completing each other. Marriage is not about making each other happy. Marriage, biblically, is about making each other holy. And there's a big difference. It's about preparing each other for your wedding day with the groom of Jesus Christ. And you can tell, by the way, that God designed marriage that this is how it was supposed to work. There's no faster way to see your sin than to get married. Amen? Let's be honest. Uh, and I could say that as a man who married up, right? Most of you guys did marry up. That's what we do. Marriage is a gigantic mirror that reveals your warts. That is what it does. Especially, like I said, if you married up like I did. You see them all very plainly. And you can also feel it. Those of you that are married, do you, do you remember back in the beginning of your marriage? Is it not true that you guys worked so hard at becoming more of the person that God created you to be? There's a lot of effort, a lot of strength. The sad truth is that we often neglect this, don't we? As the years go on. And when we do that, our marriage begins to shrink and becomes more about completing each other and making each other happy, enter in all the fights, all the arguments, all of our earthly troubles. And marriage is about being holy. Can you imagine the difference in your marriage, how your marriage would look if you were truly to embrace this truth that marriage is about your holiness? How would that change the way you fight? How would that change the way you spend time together? How would that change the way that you parent your kids? It's an absolute game changer if you embrace it. Second point of application, steward your betrothal. And by that I mean that we should look forward in this life to our future union with Jesus Christ in its fullness. Biblically speaking, a day is coming when we will be wholly His, when nobody else will have claim on us, when we are fully wed to Jesus, when we will come down the aisle as His bride, purified because of His work done on the cross on our behalf and applied to our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. We should meditate on that, think about that, hope in that. But here's the thing, just because our marriage isn't complete now, we're betrothed to him, doesn't mean that we should not enjoy Jesus right now. Now, it's true that we're going to experience a fullness of joy when we get to heaven. There's no question about it. We have to understand that. But at the same time, we have to realize that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are united to Christ right now, and you have communion offered to Christ right now. Translation, this is not a long-distance relationship. You don't have to wait until you die to enjoy Jesus. You don't have to wait until the weekends to spend time with Him. The Sadducees were standing right in front of Christ, and they didn't even see Him or connect with Him. Does it ever feel that way for you? Like you believe this stuff, and you come to church, you're involved, but you don't make that connection. We don't have to wait. We don't have to wait because he has engaged us. And he's offered himself to us even now. Lastly, steward your assumptions. 
The reality is that like the Sadducees, some of you in this room have based your life on false assumptions. That sin isn't a big deal. That Christianity is just a social construct. That there is no definable right or wrong. That there's no knowable meaning in life. That we don't know what happens when we die or that it doesn't even matter. The scary thing isn't that you have false assumptions, because we all do. The scary thing is that we let those assumptions go completely unchecked. And the reality is that the road to hell is paved with unchecked false assumptions. With all of your assumptions about Christianity and Jesus, that sin isn't a big deal, that Jesus is just a nice guy, that this is all just a social construct, I would simply ask you this morning, if that describes you, what makes you so sure? What makes you so sure you're right? Are you sure enough to stake your life on it? Because that is exactly what you are doing when you base your life on unchecked false assumptions. As that song said this morning, the first one we sang, Jesus is the surety that you're looking for. Jesus is the answer to all of life's questions that could ever be asked. And he is standing here offering himself to you this morning. He was right in front of the Sadducees' face. And spiritually speaking, he is right in front of you right now, arms open, saying, Come to me, you tired, weary sinner, and I will give you rest. I would just say, Go to him. Go to him. Let's pray.